So uh, I want to welcome everybody to uh, this month's Houston Functional Programming User Group. And our speaker tonight is Chris Bremer. He has uh, presented here a number of times before, and his um, talks are always fun and interesting and, and sort of down to earth, um, which I really appreciate. And today he wants to give us a brief, not too difficult introduction to category theory and types. So I will turn it over to Chris to introduce himself and um, yeah, take it, take it from here, Chris. Welcome. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for having me today. This is actually a talk, uh, I came up with the idea when uh, Claude was asking for short speakers a few months ago and I was like, oh man, you know, I think this is a talk I could give off the top of my head. Uh, but I couldn't quite get it together enough to, uh, to give a talk then. Uh, but I kind of kept it in the back of my pocket and I decided that I think it's a, a pretty reasonable talk to give now. Um, a few caveats. Uh, I really am going to try to keep it, well, if not easy. Um, I want to minimize the amount of notation and the amount of like, you know, new ideas that are presented. Uh, but I also want to get somewhere. I don't want to like just say, hey, this is a category, uh, have fun. Um, I really want you to get a sense of you know, maybe why it's useful and, and, and how these things actually capture some of the design patterns that I think everyone uses and not just functional programmers. Uh, let me start off. So um, I'm going to start off with uh, sort of the dramatis personae. Uh, I guess the idea is that if you kind of understand these things, hopefully um, you'll get a sense, you'll be able to kind of follow along with a lot of the examples uh, in the talk. So the first actor I'm going to introduce is a type. So if you don't have an intuition for what a type is, you can think of it as being, I don't know, like a primitive type, like an integer or a string. Um, if you like object-oriented programming, you could think of it as being my class, just an example of a class. Or if you like functional programming, it could be my record, for example. Um, but the point is that it's not like an individual object in your uh, in your code. It's you know a sort of a general class of objects, uh, you know, a collection uh, that all have sort of the same interface. Uh, if I want to actually talk about something with that type, I'll say u colon u. Uh, so this lowercase u is an example of type u. Okay, types are great. We also have now. Hopefully, this is a functional programming seminar, so. Um, you have a sense of what a function is. So a function, I'm going to represent by an arrow going from one type to another type. Again, if we have a function uh, that takes the type u to the type v, <coughs> we can uh, we can say f colon u to v. Um, just as an example, we could have f takes int to int f of x is equal to x plus 1. Not a very exciting function, but um, <clears throat> a function for sure. I also want to insist that functions are pure. Uh, what do I mean by that? No side effects. So the function only depends on the input, uh, or the output of the function only depends on the input. So no side effects. OK, lastly. Tuples. OK, so a tuple is just a pair of types. Um, now, a lot of people who use functional programming use tuples quite a bit. Uh, but if you don't use functional programming a whole lot, you can kind of think of a tuple as being the argument of a function that takes more than one argument. So f takes u comma v to w, um, just as another example, we could have f takes int comma int to int, and f of x y is equal to x plus y. That's a perfectly good function, as we say. Um, by the way, I don't know if I can quite see the uh, the participants on the screen, 
So if you have questions, if you want to stop, uh, feel free to just unmute and hop right in. Um, perfectly happy to, to chat. Uh, and sort of the reason I like doing uh, whiteboard talks like this as opposed to uh, slide talks is that hopefully it gives you enough time and enough opportunity to, um, you know, to look at the screen and then uh, allow me to, to answer questions uh, while I'm working. Okay, so that's the end of our introduction and we're ready to start act one. What is act one? Categories. Now you might say, hey, we're jumping into things too quickly now. Um, you know, the whole point of this talk is to talk about categories, but you know, this seems like a little much at first, but fear not, a category is pretty simple. It just consists of types, a collection of types. Um, and again, I'll call these types U. It consists of arrows. Now I'm gonna be a little coy here. You can think of an arrow as a function, um, but that intuition doesn't always work. Uh, and, and, and we'll see why in a little bit. With, uh, with an example. Um, with the additional, additional properties, there's always a, uh, an identity for every type. Well, the identity does, it just leaves everything the same. Um, it behaves like, you know, f of x equals x. And we also have composition. Which if we have an arrow from u to v and an arrow from v to w, we get for free an arrow from u to v to w. So just as an example, if we have f of u equals v and g of v equals w, then we get a function here, f of g of u. Okay, not so bad. Composition is also associative. Um, and that's about it. Now, one thing before I move on is I also want to insist, and this is something that, that maybe uh, Neil can back me up on or complain about. Uh, I do want to insist that the arrows form something called a set. Now, I'm going to try to explain why, why I like things to be a set. So I think when I say set, I really sort of want you to think of, well, just a collection of objects, right? It's just a collection of things. It seems weird that I'm making this like uh, this assertion here that, that um, I want these arrows to be a set. But what I'm worried about is uh, equality between sets. Because that's actually something that really comes up a lot and it will come up as we talk. Can so I, what does it mean? Can I ask you a question? Sure, sure. Okay, um, so the category, the first sort of member of a category is the types. And you have the letter U, it, are you permitting other types as well? Or does it have to be oh, unique? Oh, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, so, so types, uh, sorry. Yeah, so, so the, in this case, it's a collection, right? So it's like, you know, U is just a, an example of a type. Okay. So in and this then, category, U and V would be, uh, would be two types in the category. Okay, okay. And then the arrows, um, so you have an example going from U arrow V. So if I could name the arrow A. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, uh, how about alpha? Is, yeah, alpha. <laughs> is, so is it defined by its relata, the, the U and the V? Nope. No, no, okay. No, and, and the reason is because uh, the arrows from U to V, so if you think about it like in a programming language, um, the type U to V, there's mm -hmm. a collection of, of, of examples of that type, right? Okay. So uh, the example I gave before, that's actually a, a good question. We were looking at, um, you know, this function uh, into int. Uh, there's actually a lot of different functions that go from int to int. You could have right. uh, g, you know, if you want, g of x is equal to x plus 2. And that's a different function. So both f and g are in the set of functions from, from int to int. Does that make okay. sense? 
so it's a it's a collection right so so yeah. uh, um, so, um uh, can you just consider the types also sets um because uh, types don't have to be sets no okay <laughs> the types are just things like like an integer is a could be def uh, the type integer could be defined as like the set of all integers <laughs> Or yes. As, yeah. As, so, so you're right. So yes, it, it could be it, the types could be sets, but that's not necessary. Oh. So if you really want to be sort of like you know a really abstract way of thinking, it's it's really just kind of like a graph, right? So the types are the nodes on the graph, and the arrows are the the edges. A directed graph. So I got a question. Sure. This job. Uh, so when I think about categories, just you know when I'm speaking English. Sure. Um, a category typically is defined by things that the members of the category have in common. Yes. Is, is that something that applies here or not? No, a category is just a thing. It's just a, a collection of types and arrows. So, so, so most categories, like, yes. So, so most categories you want to say like from the English perspective of a category, um, I might want to talk about all the types in a particular programming language as being like a category. Like Hask is, is all the types of Haskell is sort of a, a well-studied category. Um, I could also talk about the category of sets, right? And the difference between the category of sets and the category of types is that they sort of have different, there are different functions between them, right? A set, you know, it, a function between sets is just assigning one element in one set to another element in another set. But a function in the category of, of Haskell functions has to be a has to be a, a function in your language. So categories, when you say like the English word of category, you're saying you, you want to think of sort of like a, a a collection of objects that that are designed by, that are defined by a shared property. But in this case, uh, when you change categories, it also changes the arrows between different types in a category. N let me give some examples. And, and I think in this case, it's, it's really worth thinking of types and arrows as being um, types in your favorite programming language and arrows functions in your favorite programming language, if that makes sense. So um, does that answer your question? Okay, <laughs> I hope it does. Um, what do we mean by equality? So uh, when I have two sets, so, so here's an example that I had in mind of, of two sets. So a set here would just be the first three numbers, right? One, two, three. Um, and then here's another set, which is actually a set of sets, is uh, the sets of of items with one element, uh, two elements which are exactly the same, and three elements that are exactly the same, right? So these are two sets, right? This is a set of sets. This is a set of, of numbers. Um, and there's a way to identify this set with this set by counting, right? <laughs> if you count the numbers in this set, we get a we get a, a, an identification with the first three numbers. Um, so this is an example of, of what I'm going to call uh, a natural identification. And we say that sets are equal uh, if there's a natural identification between them. Um, so I did want to give you an example of a natural identification that you're probably used to, um, currying. So we can express the notion of currying in a, in a function um, or in a, in a programming language in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, these categories. So uh, a curried function is an identification between functions from u, v to w, 
these are equal to uh, functions from u goes to v goes to w. So this is partial application. And what we get is um, f of uv equals w. This is the same thing as f of uv equals w. So I'm going to call it f bar. But essentially, the idea is, is we're going from um, functions on, on pairs, on tuples, to uh, partially applied functions. Um, we'll come back to this. I mean, uh, I want currying to be sort of a, a motivating example uh, throughout the uh, throughout the talk. Um, I did want to give one more example before we move on to Act Two, uh, which is an example of a category. So I already gave you an example of a category, which was our example of you know thinking of, of types and functions in a programming language as being a category. Um, there's another way to define a category, which is which is actually fairly stupid. I'm going to call it op, um, which has the same types. But we want to define arrows, u, an op arrow from u to v is just equal to arrows from v to u. So it's really stupid. We take, uh, we take the category, uh, our original category, and we just turn the arrows around. <laughs> if you think of it, if you have like a directed graph, if you just turn all of the edges in the opposite direction, um, that gives you a new category. And it turns out it works. It's perfectly fine. Uh, so it's a, it is kind of a funny theory, because uh, you start to get a C if you really rely on, um, if, you, if you strongly rely on sort of explicit examples, because uh, category is a pretty loose definition. Um, again, we'll, we'll come to back to this too. But uh, I want to talk a little bit more about um, what we can do with categories. A so quick question. Sure. Uh, for when you set uh, on equality. Sure. Uh, is that a is your notion of equality for uh, category? So it says sets are equal. Sets are equal. Yes. Okay. Uh... So it, so so the reason I want to say we have equality is because I'm only ever going to worry about equality for equality of, of functions <laughs> or arrows. Hmm. OK. Um, and that's actually the only place where I'm actually going to use or, or need equality. Um, OK. OK. So now we're going to get into sort of the, the nitty gritty of categories. This is act two. Um, functors. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about functions, and I think you, you brought up a, an example of a. If we want to identify categories, for example, you need some way to get from category A to category B. Um, we're actually not really going to leave the category of a particular language in this talk. Um, but we do have a way of either transforming categories or, or, or taking one category to another category that acts kind of like a function. And this is something called a functor. So a functor is just f of u. So this is uh, 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 basically an association from, from a type to a different type uh, with the following properties. We have a map function, so f map takes if we have a function from u to v. This goes to f of u goes to f of v. So anytime we have a function, we should be able to create a new function on um, on objects where we've applied this functor, and this map behaves well with respect to identity and function composition. So we've actually, in our dramatis personae, 
we've actually come up with a couple of examples of functors that we can already sort of think about. Um, so here's an example of a function, a functor, t of u. Um, I'm going to put an a here, but let's not worry about that for now. Is just the tuple u comma a, right? So it's not really a map between sets or anything like that. We're just saying like, okay, so we had this type before, but once we apply this functor to it, we get a new type, which is the tuple type u comma a. Here, a is just a well, I mean, you can think of it as a as a param a type parameter or something like that. Um, I'm not going to uh, worry about it too much, but but in most of the identities, we're going to sort of uh, assume that you know a is 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 just sort of auxiliary to this to this functor. Um, if you want to calculate t map, uh, well, this should take a function from u to v. Let's say we have f is a function to u to v to a new function u a goes to v a. I'll call this f bar. And f of u, oh, sorry, f bar of u comma a is equal to f of u comma a. So all we're doing is we're just sort of like, if we have a function from u to v, it just it just only does anything to the first part of the of the tuple. So that's a nice example of a function. Here's another one. Um, this is a little bit more complicated. I'll call this h a. Yeah. Um, so we don't need to work, just think about tuples. We could also have a a functor um, which has as output um, an arrow. So we can take h a of u is equal to the set of functions or the type of functions from a to u. Now this one's a little bit more funny because if you remember, we should have a, a mapping from f takes u to v to a goes to u to v. A goes to v. Now, this isn't so bad. Uh, essentially, we already have this map from u to v, right? So if you kind of follow through and apply composition, you get a map f bar from a to v. So if you want to think about it, f bar of um, I'll call this g, f bar of g of a is just equal to uh, f of g of a, right? So you apply g first, and then we apply f. And that gives us a function from a to b. Um, hopefully, that's not decision mode. Here we go. Uh, now there's one more function functor that is a little bit funny, and we're, we're going to come back to it. Um, again, if there's any questions, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to give a highish level thing, and, and hopefully you'll be able to to kind of look at these notes later and and, and figure out ah, it's it's, it's not too bad. Um, so I'm going to define one more functor. So <laughs> this is a little bit funny. So if before we defined it, we defined h as um, maps from a to u. We can also define a functor uh, which is maps from u to a. Um, now, this is a little bit interesting because if we try to define c map, uh, if we have a function from u to v, uh, and we wanted to find a, a function from u goes to a and to v goes to a, we're a little bit stuck because unfortunately, the arrows go the wrong way. Um, the natural composition goes from u 
to V to A. So if we have a guy down here um, and this function here, we get a mapping um, G from U to A. So this is a little bit funny because if we, if we rewrite this expression, um, if we have a map from U to V, we get a map from U to A, V to A, from V to A goes to U to A. I'll write this map down explicitly. So um, this map is just G of A goes to um, G of F of A, right? So this gives you a map from, from U to A. Uh, but what we end up doing is we just say, oh, OK, well, um, forget about that. This is actually a functor from the category, the opposite category. So remember, I defined the opposite category earlier. This is kind of a, a, a little brain teaser here. Um, but um, I did want to bring it up. It's actually going to be sort of useful useful later on. Uh, so this is a, this is sort of the first example of a functor where we're, we're going outside of our original category. Uh, this is something called a, a contravariant functor. Um, so if you come across contravariant, that's why it's called a contravariant functor. In fact, you know what? I think it's funny. Uh, C sharp, the latest release of C sharp, includes uh, covariant and contravariant inputs. So I think um, even if you are a C-sharp developer, you'll, you'll end up seeing some of this terminology at, at, at various places. Um, OK. So I want to point out something funny that hey, comes up. Hey, Chris, can I stop you for a minute? Yeah, sure, sure. Can you scroll back up there? Yeah, of course. So when you first explained the map, I thought I understood it. Sure. <laughs> um, but that last one, I'm not sure I really understand what, what's going on. <laughs> so, yeah. So here's the problem is that a functor can potentially take us outside of our original category, right? In this uh, case, this functor takes us to the opposite category. Sort of, uh, okay. it's a bit of Calvin ball, unfortunately, if you're familiar with that. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what Calvin Ball is. <laughs> I like to but, impose it on people all the time, but that's a whole other issue. No. Um, no. So think of, think about it this way. It, I'm not actually, um, essentially, I'd, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about sort of contravariant functors, uh, but um, maybe uh, I think it's sort of a, a, a deep topic. Uh, so. Think think of the think of this this contravariant functor as sort of a bonus um, <laughs> bonus content, and uh, you know maybe maybe it'll make a little bit more sense when I sort of talk about why we care about these things in Act Three. Well, it, it actually helps a lot to say that you could use this map and you end up going outside the category. Yeah, yeah. Because that yeah okay. Yeah, so so that's that's the idea is that, that we actually ended up using that that silly category that I defined earlier on. Okay, but no, I mean that's a that's a good question. Uh, I'm I'm really just punting on it because it's a hard question. <laughs> uh, can I ask a question? Maybe I should have asked this a lot earlier, but uh, no, it's fine. So if you scroll up again, <laughs> uh -oh. so this all the, the one problem with the whiteboard is I don't have a good way of navigating through the the whiteboard. <laughs> Well, so I was wondering when you write down F map colon and you have what look like arrows, yes. I'm actually not sure what those are. Are they arrows or are they functions? Uh, they, are, uh, they are set functions. Set functions. Yeah. So um, I am being a little bit, so that's actually a really good, that's a, okay. So that's actually another very deep question. <laughs> so uh, the point is, this guy's, uh, let me use this. This guy's a set, right? U to V uh -huh. is also a set. Um, and F map is a function from this set to this set. 
So I'm being a little bit loose, uh, fast and loose okay. with the rules when I'm saying this is an arrow. But <clears throat> in the case in the case of the programming, like you know, if we're if we're working inside of a uh, a programming language, this actually is fine because both of these things are actually types. So not only is it a map on sets, but it turns out it's also well defined in the programming language. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, it's a little yeah. So, so yeah. I'm being again. You're right. I mean, you actually, uh, it's actually good because you sort of caught me in in being a little bit fast and loose. But <laughs> you're absolutely right that this is this is actually a morphism between sets. But when we when we do them when we calculate things, all the examples we're going to see this is also an error <laughs> in the programming oh. language. Oh dear. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So I want to. Um, <clears throat> I want to come back to currying. And this maybe will give you a sense of, of where, where we're going with this. I'm going to call it currying redux. I realize I've gone way over my promised time, but um, I'm actually glad that there's lots of different questions because I, I, I like talking more than uh, just lecturing. Um, so remember, we, we stated what currying was before. Fortunately, it's right here. So. Here's, if you look to the left of the board, you see uh, the definition of currying. Um, we can actually rewrite currying in terms of functors. Tu goes to V is equal to U goes to H of V. Um, hopefully you can't hear that. My five-year-old just started playing the, um, the the squeeze box downstairs. So it's, hopefully it doesn't get too loud. Um, anyways, so this is actually really pretty cool. So I mean, this is hopefully a, a very uh, suggestive formulation. Um, another word for this is anytime we have two function, two functors that behave like this, uh, we call T and H are something called uh, an adjoint pair. Um, I'm going to explain why we care about adjoint pairs in just a second. Um, but it turns out that these are something that mathematicians really love to work with. I actually spent a good portion of my, uh, my thesis and, and early research racking my brain around uh, different, different kinds of adjoint pairs. Um, and certainly uh, Neil did as well. Um, but, they're, but they're super important to mathematicians. So there's a lot of prior art between uh, you know, behind structures that look like this. We have another example of an adjoint pair, which um, you're absolutely going to hate if you <laughs> didn't like the previous example. C A U goes to V is equal to, oh, sorry, this is, remember, C is a functor to the opposite category. Um, this is actually the same as U goes to C A V. I knew you'd hate it. Um, so, <laughs> CA, CA is also an adjoint pair. Um, we'll get back to that in a little bit. Uh, I do think it's a little bit cheeky uh, to say that and to introduce it, um, but it's not such a bad thing because we're ready for our final act, which is final act, act three. everybody's favorite monads. And I'm going to pull a rabbit out of a hat, explain why we spent all this time discussing these arrows, is because this sort of gives us the foundation for the idea of what, what a monad is in, um, in category theory. So all a monad is, is it's a functor It's a special kind of functor M U. Um, it has a special map return, which is a function from from U to MU, and another special map called bind, which is a function from U to MV, 
goes to MV, MU goes to MV. Okay. Um, I'll give an example of why these things are useful. Um, but I want to state a really cool fact first, something that I, I really don't see a whole lot in introductions to category theory. Uh, in usually comes a little bit later, but this is a flat due to a, a mathematician called Kleisley, uh, which is that monads are really adjoint functors. Well, let me explain. If, if L U goes to V is equal to U goes to RV, right? So this is our adjoint pair. Then R L U is a monad. Okay, so this is kind of a wild fact. Um, because we haven't really talked about composition of, of functors, but it, it sort of works as you might expect. You sort of apply the first functor and then you apply the second functor. Um, <clears throat> but what's wild is that these two sort of, you know, highfalutin uh, fancy theories are, uh, are really equivalent. Um, I'll even give you an inkling of how to prove it. I know that we're probably not, most of us haven't done a proof in a while, but uh, let me explain really quickly. Um, let's say that we have U. So one of the facts about categories is we know that we have the identity map. Uh, we also know that L map takes the identity map to some map from LU to LU. So it's actually the identity because it, it behaves well under uh, and then finally, under this adjunction map, we get an identification from U goes to R L U, and this our return function. So it turns out if you sort of like follow through and, and do a lot of work, uh, you can actually show that this that you can get sort of the the bind functor in the same way, uh, plus all the other compatibilities. Um, I do want to mention just for completeness. Uh, so plus compatibility. There are certain compatibilities between return and bind, but I'm not going to get into it. Um, and now we have the payoff, which is why do we care all this stuff about all this stuff? Well, it all comes back to currying. So currying. What comes after Redux? Tredux, maybe. Um, if we look at our previous adjoint pairs, so we had before uh, uh, T and H were an adjoint pair, and these correspond to the monad, uh, let's see, if I remember, it's H T is equal to, or H T of U is equal to functions from A to U comma A to pairs U comma A. And this is something called the state monad. Now, why do we care about the state monad? Well, it turns out this is the best way to work with a mutable state when you're doing functional programming. So the way I like to think about this is let's say that we have an object right? Uh, 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 an object-oriented kind of object. And this object has me uh, methods. So I'm going to call the object has type A. And we have a method. So the method of um, takes this A and some input U and then outputs some V. So you might ask, well, this is a problem, right? Because this gets mutated, right? Typically, when you have 
an object and you're applying a method, uh, there's no guarantee that you're not going to change sort of the, uh, the object that's calling. Um, so what we do is we then add this as an output, right? Because the function, if it's mutating the, um, if it's mutating the, the, the caller of the thing, then it's reasonable to, to think of the caller as being another output, output of the function, but just discarding it, right? So it's actually funny. I know I, I gave a talk related to, to MATLAB last time. Um, MATLAB is an example of a, of a language that doesn't have naturally something called a handle class. So if you want to mutate <laughs> your handle, which is the pointer to this, you actually have to return this as one of the outputs of the function. You can return it as a discard, but you know it doesn't really matter. Um, so if you stare at this long enough, you actually see that this is really the same thing as taking a function from u to uh, a. So this is this. This is our input goes to our output comma a this is our output and this is our discard this right um, and then the bind function gives us a way to uh, consecutively call methods on the function um, so basically allows us to call multiple methods and keep track of, uh, of state. So this is sort of the funny thing is that if, if you are uh, sort of perverse, you can sort of get object-oriented, a lot of the basics of object-oriented programming out of this monad, or you can you can uh, represent a lot of object-oriented programming using this monad. Okay, I have one more example, and then and then we'll be done. Um, so remember, we had our other functor, so C A C A is an adjoint pair. So the corresponding monad is just C C of U is equal to uh, functions from u to a goes to a. This is something called the continuation monad. Um, now, this is a little bit weird. Uh, but if we take a to be something like a task, right? Then u to a is an action, right? It takes as input and it does something, right? Given some input, you, you, you do something with that, with that input, uh, but you don't return anything. And then a function u to a goes to a is a callback. Right? So when you have a function with a callback, think about it like this. You have f of f of u comma um, callback is equal to void or task, right? And what this is, this is a function from u goes to um, goes to a goes to task. And so, in this case, the bind the bind function is really just giving us a way of, of combining actions and a bunch of different callbacks. So, if you're if you're used to JavaScript, um, especially the people who are who are learning JavaScript. You find that a lot of JavaScript uh, involves a lot of callbacks, and it's hard to reason about those callback functions. But um, there's actually like a purely functional way to, to think about it. 
and this purely functional way has has a has a background in mathematics. Okay, so that's about it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share these lecture notes, well, with Cloud. <laughs> uh, but yeah, um, hopefully that's it's it's not it's not too bad. I guess when I said a gentle introduction to um, category theory. I really wanted to avoid being bogged down in sort of introducing too many new ideas and too many uh, too many thoughts. But I also, you know, as I said, I wanted to make it pretty far, and, and I feel like, you know, we got to the point where we can actually see some some monads that are actually useful things we use every day as programmers. Any questions? Well, I want to thank you so much. This was really, this was really fun and interesting. And um, yeah, so let's open up for uh, questions. So I have a question. Sure. I'll start out by saying I don't really expect you to be able to answer it, but if you can, this it'd be really helpful for me. Sure. Is this conception of a monad more like Leibniz or Plotinus's monad? Ooh. Uh... You know what? It's um, I don't know. I, I actually I don't know. Uh, this is to me a something, or at least my understanding of this comes out of early category theory, which was in the nineteen forties, um, which was well after Leibniz. Yeah, so, <laughs> and, and way after Plotinus, but yeah, okay. yeah. So, so I think maybe the name, maybe there's some some relationship in the name, but um, this is this is something something sort of different. Okay. Uh, I always wondered that too, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, because. Yeah, so I know Monad from from Leibniz, and it's uh, Chris. You know, as you're struggling to make a connection, I can't possibly see a connection either. <laughs> you know, but yeah. it's such a particular word to use that it's hard to believe that there's that there wasn't some thinking of Leibniz when uh, when this was introduced. But I think when Leibniz was talking about Monads. Um, I think that came out of his um, explorations with um, calculus, like the infinite symbol. But I mean, I don't know a lot about programming, so I don't know, you know, mm. I guess how monads relate to category theory from what I've seen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's, is, is it some, you know, it, it probably, it certainly was influenced by, by that concept, but um I don't, I don't quite know. My, uh, I, I, do you have a definition of what a Leibniz monad is? Well, from what, know, I remember, <laughs> from what I remember in philosophy, I think it, it was like some indivisible particle, like some, it was supposed right, to be like right. some one foundation, I guess, of a, of a proto atom, something like that mm. outside of space time. And I guess, yeah. Leibniz's philosophy, God is the big monad that we're all connected to, and like some network or graph. But <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it was sort of an alternative to Aristotle's substances. These were more idealized. Um, but yeah, I mean, so it's so it's really hard to see like what the connection possibly could be between those. But then why why use the word monad? <laughs> I think you'd have to ask Saunders McLean. Um, well, I mean, technically, it just means the one. Yeah. Uh huh. Right. right. I mean, um, it's unary, right? <laughs> right. And, and it, it's, I'm really not a philosophy kind of guy. Um, I have a son who's doing some platitis work right now. Um, and, and so when he started talking to me about it, it's like, there's sort of a connection here, uh, but it's hard to explain. Um, 
especially if you don't know anything about Gnosticism. <laughs> I definitely do not know anything about Gnosticism. Well, so yeah, so I have this really bad habit of, and, and Claude can confirm this, of like making connections between programming things and, and random things out, outside of that. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so anyway, it was just, it's just one of those things that may not bother anybody else. <laughs> but, well, I know an interesting connection, I guess. Um, like I know uh, Cantor who did uh, develop set theory. He was interested in like Leibniz and Kabbalah, stuff like that. Yeah. But um, I mean, I'm not a mathematician, but I know from what I hear about category theory is supposed to be a, a better foundational theory than set theory from what I've read. I mean, I... well, I, I'm an English and history major, so none of this stuff makes any sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so so one thing, I don't know, I, I, I tried to, Im to get this idea across in sort of the previous talk that I gave here um, using computation expressions, right? So, Computation expression is the way F sharp represents monads in its language. Um, is that in some ways, you know, if you think of a language as being from the point of view of an object oriented programming philosophy, uh, your grammar is quite limited, right? If you have an object, you have only a certain number of methods that that object can can handle um, when you're looking in terms of sort of a computation expression in F sharp or, or, or monads, uh, you can consistently sort of it gives you a a way to string together methods in a coherent way uh, in the same way that you can kind of concatenate words in a sentence, and that's kind of how I like to think about it. Um, so I think there's sort of a, a certainly a, a grammar aspect that this talk doesn't capture, but uh, but I do I do like to think of things in terms of language, and maybe that's and maybe that's a different talk that I could do. Um, monads for English majors that would be uh, that would be pretty awesome. But yeah, uh, I don't know. My, my hope with this talk is that if I can kind of pare it down or, or practice it, it might be something I could I could give elsewhere at you know another meetup or a conference or something like that. So um, thank you for being my my guinea pigs. Uh, I don't know if it was as kind of an introduction as I had originally wanted it to, but um, maybe having given it once, I can. I can work on that. I, I seem to remember you saying something about fitting this on a napkin at the well, last meetup or something like that. And I don't, I've never seen this kind of napkin. <laughs> so that's a good question. Um, I, you can see everything on, if you were to unfold the napkin into four parts. Right, right. <laughs> you probably, you could probably do this. Um, so yeah, I, I, that was the original goal for the talk, but it becomes a bit of a trade-off, right? So, so one thing when I give talks like this, I really do like board talks because I think that they help with pacing and help prevent you from sort of trying to put too much into a single slide. Um, and, but they do sort of slow down the pacing. And then the other trade-off is I wanted to give you sort of a full story where we started with some abstract concepts like arrows and, and types and some, you know, kind of pictorial math and then end up with something that I really do think that, you know, we do use every day as, as programmers. I think uh, thinking of, of ob methods applied to objects as really being an example of a, a pretty standard monad. Um, and also thinking of callback functions and actions as being a different kind of monad are, are useful. Um, especially since they tie in with Korean, which is somehow the font of, of both of these very commonly used uh, 
monads, but it is also sort of something that's considered central to functional programming. I did have a question. You were talking about the, the op arrow as, as yes. being just the, essentially, is it flipping the, like if you have U to V, it's V to U essentially? Yeah. Um, I, I know a lot of times in like, for practical purposes when programming, um, like, like say, say V was an int and U was a decimal number. Um, uh, v, v to U is not equivalent uh, the, 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 you know, going the other direction. So if you if you converted the decimal to an integer and the integer to a decimal, um, it's not like the initial integer is going to be the same as the the final integer. That's true. Here's a here's a counterpoint to that though, uh, which is you're absolutely right that for example, int goes to decimal is sort of a standard um, is a standard embedding, but then decimal to int is not, you're right, it, you need some sort of rounding. Um, so it's not necessarily the same arrow. But what happens is, is if I want to say, maybe if I have a function, which says, um, let's say I have width, of a div, right? <laughs> so width takes a uh, integer to a div, right? In HTML. So here I'm just trying to understand like a layout of a screen. Um, it's also possible to, uh, sorry, it's, it's possible to get a, a width from a decimal to a div. Sorry, I, I think I did things backwards, which is sort of apropos. Uh, let's say that we have, let's say that we have a mapping from decimal to div, right? Um, this gives us an automatic mapping width takes int to div which is inherited from our, our mapping from decimal to div. And it's basically just taking the, the coercion from int to decimal and then taking that to div. So this is a funny situation where our original map from int to, int to decimal actually gives us a map in the opposite direction from a width function from decimal to a width function from int. Does that make sense? That's our op functor right there. Um, okay, well, anyways, <laughs> we can talk about it more later. Uh, I need to uh, take a quick break, but I'll be back for um, more discussion and more questions. Well, on, on that note, I think I'll then stop the recording. Cool. And yeah, then we can talk when you get back. Awesome. Okay. Thanks so much. This is yeah. great. Thanks, Chris. Yeah.